number 245, More About Jesus. And I know we love to know more, more, more. Look at Tammy. Tammy. <laughs> Next one is number 448, Oh, When Will I See Jesus? Because I know we're looking forward to that day.
Brother Vladimir, I could hear you trumping it. Thank you. Oh was, oh, was that Isaac? Oh, my. Isaac, the trumpet was sounding. All right, so let's stand and sing our opening song, number 503, A Quiet Place. It's time for our call to prayer, and we will use whisper a prayer as we come forward for our family prayer. Oh, dear can Heavenly Father, we come here today, Lord, to give thanks for all that you have done for us. Thank you for allowing us to make it through another beautiful week, oh, Father. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the cool breeze. Lord, thank you for these little things in which that we take for granted, oh, Father, that we need, Lord, to continue to sustain life. Lord, build our friends and families, Lord, as we get through this day, get you this week, get you this time, get you life, period, Father. We cannot do so without your help, without your guidance, without your grace, the grace that you have shown us so often, oh, Father. Continue, Lord, to continue to send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we continue to move forward and so that we can be the salt of the earth in which we were intended to be, O oh Father, to show people love, show guidance, show kindness to one another. Lord, be with these family members that have lost loved ones. Continue to, we as Christians, to lean on those individuals and show them love, show them grace, O oh Father. Show them kindness, Lord. Lord, be with those ones that are sick and shutting. Continue to rest your, holy, rest your hands on their bodies, O oh Father. May it be your will, oh Father, in which way you would like to go. For us all that's been here, Father, continue to open our hearts and minds as we receive the message today that's going to be presented to us. Help us be able to understand it and be able to apply it to our lives. And continue to become better Christians, we ask, we pray. Amen.
it's time for our little lamb's offering. And we will sing as a child and Jesus loves me. Good morning, boys and girls. Morning. Morning. Okay, let's let that was this. Let's try to get it in unison. That means everybody together. Let's do good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, and happy Sabbath. Fantastic, you guys did great. So, who here likes animals? Can some of you share with me what your favorite animal is? Tiger, cats, turtles, horses, any others? So today I am going to tell you a story about a certain animal, but before we do that, I have a question for you. Do you think that animals are obedient to God? Yes? Okay, yes? yes. Oh, okay. So you said they went into Noah's Ark. So we have some young Bible scholars up here. So can you give me some examples in the Bible of when animals were obedient? I think we probably can come up with at least six or eight. Ravens fed Elijah. Yes, the ravens fed Elijah. We already have Noah's Ark. What else? Any other? The lions in the lion den. Very good. Any others? Come on. I know there's more. Yes. Okay, we have another one. Two birdies. Can you say that again? 
two birdies. Two, you may, I think you're probably talking about when Noah sent the doves and the dove brought back an olive branch. Very good. Uh, okay, how about there's a story about a big fish or possibly a whale? Do you know who was involved in that? Jonah. Very good. Okay, so that was a very obedient whale. Uh, what other ones? Do we have any other ones? How about when the Israelites wanted to eat meat and a bunch of quail came? Do you remember that one? Those quail were obedient. Do you have one? Okay, how about... When the fish went into the fish net of the disciples in the boat. Yes, that one's a very good one. We're doing really well. Now, there, yes. When Peter found a coin in the fish. Very good. Do we have another one? There is one that is that hasn't been mentioned yet about an animal that is similar to your favorite animal. Can anyone think? Donkey? A donkey. Is there a story where a donkey was obedient? Yes. Balaam's donkey. Very good. Okay, so, so we have a bunch of examples of in the Bible of where animals were obedient. So now I'm going to tell you the story of a time in my life when the animal was obedient. So when I was uh, maybe... I don't maybe 10 years old. It's hard for me to remember exactly how old I was. Um, we, my brother and sister and I and my parents, we were spending time out in western Colorado on a big piece of property. And my brother and I decided that we wanted to spend the whole summer camping. Have any of you ever camped? Maybe some of the pathfinders have gone camping. So we wanted to spend not just one or two or three days camping. We wanted to spend the whole summer camping. So we set up a tent in our, um, on our property near our, um, near our house. And my brother and I spent the entire summer sleeping in the tent. And we really had a great time in that tent. And one night, my mom got up in the night and she looked out the window and she could see she could see our tent from that window and do you know what she saw she saw the tent what else do you think maybe she saw the property yeah she saw the property too but maybe an animal do you think she what kind of animal do you think she saw a tiger no there are no tigers a bear. There it is. She saw a bear. And do you know how close that bear came to the tent? He came this close. He just went right up next to the tent. And do you know, do you know tents, you know tents are made out of such strong material that a bear couldn't possibly tear through it? Yeah, that's very true. Actually, the tent is made out of a canvas that is not very strong, and with one swipe of the paw, the bear would be through. And he was walking right up next to the tent. And my mom prayed that the bear would not mess with us. And he didn't because he was obedient. And we had had other problems with bears. This is not like the bears that were living in that area were really nice, well-behaved bears in general. We had bears that would get up on the front porch of our cabin, and they would put their muddy paw prints on the front door because they could smell food inside. Another bear, 
we accidentally left the window of the car rolled down. The bear climbed in the car and started causing trouble in that car. He even stole a briefcase out of the car and dragged it down the hill um, for a bit until he realized there was no food in it. So these were not very nice bears that lived there, but when my mom prayed, the bear was obedient, and I believe that there were angels there saying to the bear, don't go past this line. Do not go inside of the tent, and the bear was obedient. So if you think about this, think about how much, how much smarter we are as human beings than animals are, yet the animals know how to obey God. So I just want you to think about that for a minute and think about if the animals can obey God, then we can too. Okay, so each one of you consider what do you need to do to be obedient to God and then think about all of these animals and how they are obedient as well. So do we have a volunteer to uh, have a prayer for us? We have a volunteer? No volunteer. Okay, come on up. Fantastic. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done. Help us have a wonderful Sabbath. Help us to not do bad things. Help us to be good and help us not to go to bad places. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless each one of these children and every person here. May we follow you and may we obe be obedient to you and follow you in all of our ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Now is the time in our service where we can worship through returning our tithes and our offerings. And it is always a blessing to be able to worship in this way because the Lord has blessed us with so many things. And we, uh, oftentimes we think about ourselves as the owners of things, but really, we are the stewards of things because God owns everything and he has blessed us with the opportunity to be his stewards. So today's loose offering goes to the local church budget, which helps to keep this church with the lights on. It helps to keep the school running and bless our local congregation here. And I also encourage you to look at the special ministries that we have throughout the church, including the Pathfinders and some of the other areas that, uh, that need funding. So please bow your heads with me and uh, let's uh, ask for the Lord's blessing. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here to worship you. Thank you for blessing us with resources and please may we be uh, good and faithful stewards of all that you have given to us. Please may these funds be used as a blessing to this local community, to this congregation, and may it bring many uh, hearts to you and to have a saving relationship with you. We ask that you be with each person here and um, bless them in accordance with your will, and please bless these tithes and offerings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, for the scripture reading. Matthew 22, 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. These are the words of Christ. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Okay, now it's time to sing our song of meditation, Speak, O Lord. It's in the back of your bulletin. bow our heads together for a word of prayer. 
Father, we have invited you to come and speak to us. And so we trust that you will listen and that you will indeed fulfill what you have promised that you would do for us. Our hearts extend today to those who are not able to be here with us in this space for any number of reasons. We ask that virtue would go out from you to them wherever they may be. Be with those who are joining us um, on the live stream. We pray that they might receive a blessing that is as rich as the one we experience here together. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to remind you all at 2.30 this afternoon that we have a wonderful program, Hope to Wholeness. We have a variety of different seminars that will be taking place including suicide prevention, Narcan training. Uh, some of you are familiar with people who overdose from heroin. Narcan is something that can help to save their lives. And so we'll have presentations beginning at 2.30 this afternoon. Um, I would encourage you to just come and support. This is a very real problem in this community, the Troy community, addiction and mental health. So that's our aim. And then from Sunday through Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we will have presentations here as well. Looking forward to seeing you. Continuing on in our series, Masterpieces, today's presentation is entitled Mindful, Mindful. Um, but I want to first say welcome to those who are visiting with us today. We are better because you are here. We are thankful that the Lord has seen fit to bring you here. Um, and I want to just recognize um, Trevor and, and Carly, who have, many of us have been praying for them and for their precious little man, Blake, right? For little Blake. So why don't you all raise your hand? So some of you all were on the prayer line and you didn't, you didn't know, and Blake is right there in daddy's arms. What a wonderful answer to prayer. Um, the last time I saw Blake and Trevor said it this morning, it's good to see him not hooked up with all types of stuff, but man, what a wonderful and mighty God we serve. So grateful to see you all here. But um, the title of our message today is Mindful. Mindful. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the creator, individuality, power, power to think and to do. Power to think and to do. There are approximately, and I'm not a physician, so some of those in the medical field could correct me later on. There are apparently, approximately, 78 organs in the human body. Which do you think is the most important? Don't answer, just, just think. Which would you say is the most important out of all 78 organs in the human body? Now, all of us, whether we're in the medical field or not, are aware that when we have a problem with one of our organs, it greatly complicates our lives. Is that true, yes or no? And so there are treatments and procedures and all types of things that can address this. I wanna to talk to you all 
about one of these organs today. But first, I want to tell you about an article that was written and it was written about what's known as a rival fallacy. What is it called, friends? A rival fallacy. And a rival fallacy is simply this. You set your mind on a particular goal or a particular uh, experience that you want to have and you work, you train, you go to school, you do everything that you are encouraged to do in order to reach this particular milestone. And then you get there and you realize that your life is not magically better because you've arrived at whatever this particular thing or place is. Arrival fallacy. Now some people, some people don't get the aha moment of arrival fallacy until they're perhaps in a midlife crisis, others earlier, and some still later. Psychologist Dr. Ben Shahar said, a rival fallacy is the reason some Hollywood stars struggle with mental health issues and substance abuse later on in their lives. A rival fallacy. But I want to suggest to you today that Hollywood stars are not the only ones to struggle with a rival fallacy. Even believers struggle with a rival fallacy. What do I mean? Once I've accepted Jesus in my life, then everything is going to be all right. Once I've changed my diet, I am no longer susceptible to sickness or illness. Once I have done this or that, that God speaks in his word, I am absolutely, positively guaranteed that nothing will happen to me that is undesirable. I suggest to you again today, dear brothers and sisters, that even believers suffer from a rival fallacy. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that man was made perfect without sin. But after Adam and Eve sinned, something changed. Specifically, reason and intellect, which had had the rulership in terms of the minds of men, intellect and reason no longer had the sway over our minds, but now they were submitted to a new king whose name is Desire. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now those who are students of the Bible will know that this is an enormous transition because when you are reading in the scriptures, you will find that people were living up to 900 years according to the biblical record. But because of this swap that took place in the human brain with reason and intellect being subverted by desire, the wickedness of man became so great, so great that God says, I must lessen the amount of years that I allow human beings to live. Because if I don't lessen the amount of years that human beings live, I want you to just think with me, what would 900 years of rebellious living look like? What would 900 years of selfishness look like? So in mercy, God says, man's days shall be 120 years. I'm going to take 
the majority in centuries of years off of men's lives. This would have included, my dear friends, not only a disappearance in the quantity of life or how long man would live, but also a lessening in the quality of man's life. Disease and sickness were now more difficult for human beings outside of the Garden of Eden to fight off. The effects of this are still dealt with today. The image of God has been almost obliterated in humanity, and yet it is still there. God's image, still his stamp, still rests on human beings. Friends, Jesus came to restore in man what was lost to sin. Listen to what the Bible says about Jesus, talking about the restoration, and I'll just key you in. The flip that we suggested took place in the mind where reason and intellect are subverted by desire. Now listen to what the Bible says of Jesus. He is the image, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image, that is Jesus. So if you ever think to yourself, what did humanity lose when we sinned? Genesis chapter 1 says we were created in the image of God. Colossians chapter 1 says if you want to know what you lost, look at Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In other words, what the text is suggesting to us is that Jesus now has taken the place that Adam forfeited by his sin. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, this is speaking of Jesus, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Look at that first part. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is how God originally created mankind, to love righteousness and be simpletons as it regarded to lawlessness or iniquity. So Jesus has came to demonstrate what the image of God restored in human beings, what that even looks like. But I've already suggested to you that believers can experience a rival fallacy. Friends, accepting Jesus doesn't do away with the realities of living in a sinful world. In fact, quite the opposite. Accepting Jesus may, it just might, my friends, intensify the realities of you and I living in a sinful world. Perhaps nowhere is this more keenly felt in the body's 78 organs than in the brain. I don't need to tell you about the rising rates of depression and anxiety along with other mental illnesses. Seventh day at Venice Christians, my friends, don't believe in a get out of jail free card. Let me say that again. Seventh day at Venice Christians don't believe in a get out of jail free card. What do I mean when I say that? Seventh day Adventist Christians don't believe that simply having right belief means that you are immune to dealing with the realities of living in a sinful world. Now, I suggested on last week that many have preached, myself included, that if you do this, that, and the other, then you won't get sick. But all you got to do is read the book of Job, and you will discover 
that bad things, even sickness, happens to good people. Who are, and notice what the Bible says about Job. It says he was a perfect and upright man. One of the few people in the entirety of scriptures that this is written of. And Job was covered with boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Now, let me say it again. Seventh-day Adventist Christians don't believe in a get-out-of-jail-free card. Even though we believe the scriptures, when the scriptures point us to a better way to live, we don't believe any one of us can avoid the effects of sin, for these are done away with only when Jesus returns. How real is this, specifically as it regards to our brains? I want to share with you the examples in the Bible of people that you are very familiar with, but perhaps I will share these with you in a way that maybe you have, maybe you have not heard them before. The first one is in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. It's speaking about Hannah. Who is it speaking about, friends? Hannah. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. If you will indeed look on the what, beloved? On the affliction. In the Hebrew, this is a word that's pronounced oni. Oni. It can be translated as depression, misery, trouble. Now, I want you to follow me, saints. Hannah's prayer was that the Lord would look on her oni or her depression. What was it that caused Hannah to experience depression? What's that? Hannah was unable, as you all have said, she was unable to have children, but that wasn't the only thing that caused her depression. What else compounded the fact that she was childless? Yes, yes, that's why you only need one wife. She was being persecuted by her husband's other wife. She was being ridiculed because of her childlessness. And as a result of this, she experienced deep depression. The Bible pictures Hannah praying and reaching out to God from a place of depression. Not just because, listen to me, saints, not just because of what she's experiencing, but because of the response of those around her. She calls out to God from a place of depression. Now, let me ask you, was Hannah a spiritual woman? Yes, we would all say yes, because we know the rest of the story. Hannah goes on to, what does she do when God blesses her? with this firstborn son, Samuel. What does she do? She, she gives him back to the Lord. This is what she continues on. If you were to continue reading 1 Samuel chapter 1, she continues to say, Lord, if you bring me out of this, then I will give back this child to you. She made a vow, commitment in her life, out of a place of depression, your spirituality, listen to me, saints of the Most High. Our spirituality does not keep us from experiencing depression. And not forget your maidservant, here's the rest of the text, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, this is Elijah. 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he prayed that he might die. Let me ask you again. Was Elijah a man of God? Yes or no? Elijah was a man of God. He had an experience unlike anyone who lived in his generation. He was faithful to God. Stood against 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove alone for God on Mount Carmel. And this man of God, this prophet of the Most High God, this faithful believer and follower of God, prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father. I was interested in that word, enough. It is enough. In the original language, it means it's too much. Anybody ever been in a space in your life where you cried out to God and said, it's too much? It's too much. There's too much hurt. There's too much pain. There's too much brokenness. There's too much loss. There's, there's too much that is just not going right in my life. If you have been in that space, then you understand where Elijah is. Elijah says, Lord, it's too much. Even the godly, even the faithful can reach a space in our existence where we cry out to the Lord and say, it is too much. There is much, there is much labeling that takes place. And when it comes to mental health and mental illness, we tend to, uh, to label those who have perhaps suicidal ideations. And so there is shame that exists amongst believers. If you have the experience, nobody's going to stand up in Bible study or prayer meeting and say, church, pray for me. I'm wrestling with suicidal ideations. But we'll read about Elijah. We'll read about Elijah and somehow there's a disconnect between his experience and ours. We still consider him a man of God. We still consider him to be holy. Although we can acknowledge that he's experiencing a moment of weakness at this particular phase in his life. But Elijah is not thrown away in our minds while we would, this is what we believe, this is not the case. We believe that we would be thrown away, uh, thrown away were people to know about our mental struggles. God did something marvelous and miraculous for Elijah. He brought him, listen to me, saints. He brought him closer to himself. Do you understand the beauty of that? When we reach the space in our lives where we cry out to God and we say it's too much, even to the point of saying, Lord, it is enough. Take my life. God draws near to us. And God says, I know what you need. It's more of me. God surrounded Elijah with his presence. And we could say more about that, but I want to continue on. David, of course, in the Sabbath school lesson, the studies have been going through the book of Psalms. You cannot read through the Psalms and not think that David had mental illness. He's up, praising the Lord for his goodness and grace. Then he's down. Oh, Lord, how long? In Psalm 13, for example, which begins with David saying, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts 
and day after day have sorrow in my heart. Here's a, here's a clue, friends. When the Bible talks about the heart, it is in most cases, if not all cases, speaking about the mind. Speaking about the mind. Day after day must I have sorrow in my heart or in my mind. After pouring out his feelings and making a request to God, David ends with these lines. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. It's one of the things that I love about the Psalms of David, whenever he gets real with God and opens up and pours his heart out to God about what it is that he's going through, no matter how real he gets, he always lands in the same space. But I will trust you. Let me interpret that for you. God, I don't understand why you're allowing me to be in this space right now. God, I don't want to be in this space right now. God, it's too much for me, but I will trust you. I will trust you. Job, we already mentioned him. Job was perfect and upright, yet Job suffered. And Job, listen to what Job says. May the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said, a male child is conceived. In other words, Job, listen to me, saints. Job thought to himself, it would have been better had I never existed. Listen. And the Bible says at the end of the book of Job that through all of his challenges, listen to me, that he never sinned. Did you get that or did you miss that? That means, talking about the mind, talking about the brain, that the thought may cross our minds. Wait, wait. Maybe it would have been better that I had never been born. And God understands all the circumstances that brought Job to that space. And he understands the circumstances, yea, dare I say it, the genetics that bring some of us into that space. Finally, huh. perhaps the best example of all, Jesus. Jesus always knew that he was going to die a painful death, but the reality of that fate seems to come to a head for him in the hours before his arrest. And we talked about this in Bible study on Wednesday it was not so much the physical pain that Jesus, that caused him to tremble in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was taking on the guilt of all the sins of the world and the thought that he would be separated from his father. The gospel writes of Jesus as deeply distressed and troubled. Matthew writes that Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, who were with him in the garden, that he is, listen to me, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Matthew 26, verse 38. Luke even describes Jesus' sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. So what, my dear friends, can we learn from Jesus' final hours in the garden? We learn that fear, anxiety, and other difficult emotions are a normal part 
of the human experience even for Jesus. Now, I know some of you are like, well, wait a minute. I thought God has not given us the spirit of, no, 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 no. When we say it's a normal part of the human experience, what we mean is to experience these things is human. What we do with them determines whether we belong to God or not. But we are not unusual or even unholy simply because we experience these things. Because that would mean that Jesus was unholy. Now, was Jesus unholy? No. He was holy, harmless, and undefiled. So what can we learn from Jesus' final hours in the garden? We learn fear, anxiety, and other difficult emotions are a normal part of the human experience, even for Jesus. Listen to me, that having hope for our future won't take away the pain and sorrow of today. And that, my dear friends, is okay. Because some of us go to funerals and feel like we can't cry because we believe in the resurrection. Some of us feel like when we've experienced some of the most difficult and painful and hurtful things in our lives that we should smile more and that we should pretend as though everything is all right because that's what a Christian is supposed to do. No, 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 no. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. Is that where it stops? that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. In other words, the text doesn't say that we cannot grieve. That's what that word sorrow means. It doesn't mean that we cannot grieve, but it means that our grieving is different because of hope. Not erased because of hope, but different because of hope. Too spiritual to cry when we are hurting, too spiritual to let others around us know that we are hurting, too spiritual to even cry out to God in our prayers and say, Lord, it's too much for me. Have mercy on my soul, but I trust you. Despite knowing that he would have victory over death, and would be raised to life on the third day after his crucifixion, Jesus still experienced anxiety about that death he was facing or about the separation he was going to experience from his father. He found a quiet place and he sought his heavenly father in prayer. He also asked for the support. Listen to me. Jesus asked for the support of his friends. He called Peter, James, and John and said, come on, watch with me and pray with me. I have to, I have to emphasize this because I, I, I'm afraid that so many of us experience it. When we are going through difficult spiritual times, we isolate ourselves. When the load is too much, as it were, we isolate away from everyone else because we don't want anyone to see us in that state. We only want to be seen as Mr. or Mrs. Super Christian. But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane called his friends and said, watch with me, pray with me. Do you hear me, saints of God? Jesus said, I need someone to be close to me. So many of us make the critical mistakes when going through the difficult times in our lives to hide because of shame. Don't want anybody to know. And what that is, my dear friends, it is a revelation of the brokenness of our minds. Because God's intention is that when we are hurting, that we are surrounded by those who love us. 
and who can encourage us. There are times, there are times when you and I will have to encourage ourselves in the Lord. When David and his men returned to Ziklag and found out that all of their wives and families and their goods had all been taken and they wanted to stone David, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Why? Because he couldn't find encouragement from the folks around him. They wanted to kill him. There will be times in our experience where we must encourage ourselves in the Lord. That means just you and I and God in our secret chamber, speaking with him through prayer. Those times are going to come. But that's not everything you go through. That's not every time the load is too heavy for you. Jesus said, come on. Come aside. I need you to pray with me. And I need you to pray for me. Let me ask you this, friends. When is the last time that you made yourself vulnerable enough to tell someone who you trusted spiritually, I need you to pray for me right now? Maybe you're used to being the individual that everyone comes to when they need prayer. But, but it's something when Jesus is the one who, to whom people have prayed and to whom those who are praying have been brought to, he reaches out and says, I need your prayers. Talk about wanting to be like Jesus. We want everything except for that. But Jesus says, no, you must make yourself vulnerable and let them see that you need me just as much as they do. Pray with me. Watch with me. Pray for me. Jesus finds a quiet place, seeks his heavenly father in prayer. And he asked for his friend's support to be with him and pray with him. And that's one of the things, my dear friends, that we need when we're facing something or wrestling with our own mental illness. I know that there are those who are in this sanctuary right now, those who may be watching on the live stream, who live with mental illness and you're ashamed of it. I came here to tell you today, you don't need to be ashamed. God understands. He understands. And I understand what happens in a Christian or in a church context. We want to pray everything away. We want to anoint everything away. But just because we pray and just because we're anointed does not always equal now my mental health illness is gone. Some of us have to live with it until Jesus returns. When this mortal puts on immortality, when this corruptible puts on incorruption, and the stories of these men and women are recorded in the pages of scripture to let you know that God understands. And he will not incorrectly judge you, even if others do. You are not less of a Christian because you have a mental health challenge. You are not less of a Christian because you need medication in order to balance out what's going on in your mind. Did you hear what I said? It does not make you unsanctified or unholy. William Cowper's poetic achievements are remarkable. 
in light of the fact that mental illness plagued him the entirety of his life. He was the son of the chaplain to King George II. William worked as a lawyer for several years. At age 32, he was nominated to a position that required a public examination. He grew so fearful of that examination that he tried to commit suicide three times and nearly succeeded. During his stay of 18 months in the asylum at St. Albans, however, Cowper was converted while re reading the Book of Romans. After his release, Cowper resided in Huntington with the family of a Reverend Unwin. Upon Unwin's death, John Newton, who's familiar with John Newton? The author of Amazing Grace, the hymn. John Newton came to comfort the family and he convinced Mr. Unwin, Mrs. Unwin, excuse me, her children and Cowper to move to Olney where he lived. The period at Olney was a time of healing and spiritual growth for Cowper. Newton urged Cowper to serve Olney's poor, probably in an effort to take Cowper's mind off of his depressions, poor health, paranoia, and fears of damnation. He also convinced Cowper to write hymns for the parish's prayer meetings. Oh man, I, you know, I had already been fascinated by the life of John Newton, but this just took it over, over the top for me. Think about this, saints, that this minister of the gospel would ask someone that he knew wrestle with mental illness. He would ask them to write hymns for the church. What a man of God. What a man of God. <sighs> the result was only hymns, 70, 1779, which contained a couple of hymns well known by Cowper, at least two. He suffered a relapse and was unable to finish his work. Three of his best known works are, There is a fountain filled with blood. Wow. <sighs> Safely through another week, thou hast brought us on our way. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm. Wow. You didn't even know it, but some of the songs that you and I sing in our deepest troubles are from someone who was wrestling through his own deep troubles. His most famous hymn was perhaps God moves in mysterious, in a mysterious way. It was written about the time of another bout of mental illness during which Cowper again attempted suicide. Despite this, John Newton said of him, I can hardly form an idea of a closer walk with God than he uniformly maintained. I can hardly form an idea of a closer walk with God than he uniformly maintained. Cowper didn't begin his literary career until the age of 50. His translations of Homer and poems such as John Gilpin placed him at the forefront of English poets. And it is the literary Cowper now listed 
in reference books. But perhaps Cowper's most meaningful works were the hymns written during his fits of despair. Listen to this. Because I said to you that many of us will have to wrestle with our stuff until Jesus comes. But listen to this. It is said that on his deathbed, he stated, oh, mm, I am not shut out of heaven after all. I am not shut out of heaven after all. I must say this, many that I've known and know who have wrestled with mental illness, especially in the context of Christianity, have lived with the fear that somehow, somehow, that because of what they wrestle with, that God would close the gates of heaven to them. Nothing could be further from the truth. A friend of mine, Pastor Ariel Roldan, he and I were, we were talking one day and he shared something with me I've never forgotten. He said, God can understand if a person's heart gives out, and we do too. God can understand if a person's kidneys or liver gives out, and we do too. And he went through naming all the organs of the body, and he asked me this question, do you believe that God would not understand if the organ of our brain was not functioning, functioning as he intended it to. And we both said, yes, he will understand. He does. Seventh-day Adventist Christians believe that man's nature will be fully and finally restored when Jesus returns. Oh, beloved, I'm longing for that day. And I know that many of you, for a variety of reasons, long as passionately for that day as I do. For my brothers and sisters in Christ who wrestle with mental illness, my prayer is that God's grace will sustain each and every one of us until the organ of all organs is remade in the perfect and pristine image of God. Heaven's doors are not closed to you. God understands you. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Mm. Father, it's quite an ordeal for us to live in a broken and sinful world. And that means for many of us who are navigating through the various ills of life that we will not experience full and total deliverance until Jesus returns. I believe that's what the Apostle Paul was referring to when he said all creation groans, even the creature waiting for the redemption of the purchased possession. Lord, for our brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters who are living with and through 
mental illnesses and challenges, Lord, I pray that your super abounding grace would be sufficient for them. I pray that this might be a body of believers that lays to rest the idea that there is any need to have shame. Our world is broken. We, as human beings, are broken. I pray that when those amongst us reach out because prayer is needed, whether it is an ongoing mental health challenge or just going through a phase in life where they cry out, it's too much for me. My prayer, Lord, is that we would not try to fix one another. We would not, with good intentions, tell one another, you, don't, you shouldn't feel like that. You don't have to, don't you? We've already been reminded that having hope does not mean that we don't experience heartache and pain. Give us listening ears. Give us compassionate hearts. And help us to be able to give to one another what Peter, James, and John were unable to give to Jesus in the garden. I'll pray with you, my brother. I'll pray with you, my sister. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray. I pray that the things that we do and say and Lord, I know our intentions are good. But I pray that they would lend themselves towards helping our brothers and sisters to know that they are loved. Not just by us, but by you. Oftentimes, when we talk about things such as the judgment and the second coming of Christ and the time of trouble, these things cause greater anxiety for those who are living with mental health challenges. And we are just, we just don't know. Lord, give us a wisdom that can only come from you. And give us tenderness as we live with worship and fellowship with each other. Make us more like Jesus. Help us to be more vulnerable than we ever have been before. Because Jesus was. We look forward to the day when we can say with our brother William Cowper, Now I see that heaven's gates were never closed to me. If it's your desire to walk with this type of tenderness and compassion, if it's your desire to be used as an instrument of encouragement by the God of heaven, I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet with me. Just saying, Lord, help me. Help me to help someone. Help me to be a remover of shame instead of an instigator of it. Lord, help me. Lord, you see us on our feet. Those who have decided to stand, we ask that you will forgive us when our attitudes and our words have pushed away from you instead of inviting to you. And help us, Lord. Help us because we just don't know what it's like for one another. But you can give us the sensitivity we need, the love and understanding. That's what we need from you. Not just for those who are here in this sanctuary, yes, it begins here but even those outside of the walls of this place. Help us, Lord, 
to love as you would. I ask all of these things in the worthy name of Jesus. Let all the people of God say, Please remain standing as we prepare to sing our closing hymn. All right, number 577, In the Heart of Jesus. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye were called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, do so whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to all and the Father by him. Amen. <laughs> 